Welcome back, AP Psych Brainiacs. In our last video, we broke down the experimental method, psychology's best way of figuring out what actually causes what. And the secret weapon behind it? Random assignment. But what if a question a psychological researcher is asking doesn't work in an experiment? Like, what are the effects of a brain injury? We can't randomly assign people to get a concussion. That's less research study and more lawsuit waiting to happen. And in research terms, extremely unethical. So when experiments aren't possible, psychologists have to get creative. And that's where non-experimental methods come in. Now these methods cannot prove causation, but they can reveal patterns, trends, and meaningful relationships in human behavior. So if you're ready, grab your notes, fire up those neurons, let's jump in. One of the most common non-experimental methods used in psychology is a correlational study. A correlation is a measure of the relationship between two variables. In simpler terms, it tells us whether two things tend to go together and in which direction. For example, psychologists may study the relationship between sleep deprivation and reaction time, number of school absences and GPA, and time spent on social media and anxiety levels. Now, as much as I want to say that social media causes anxiety in teenagers, we've got to pump the brakes. Because here's the thing. Just because two variables are related doesn't mean one is causing the other. And that brings us to one of the most important phrases in all of AP psychology. Correlation does not imply causation. Just because two things happen together doesn't mean one is causing the other. The reason we can't say one variable causes the other is because, first of all, we didn't conduct an experiment. There was no random assignment, no manipulation of variables, just observation. All we can say is that two things are connected in some way, we just don't know how. And there are two big reasons why we cannot establish causality. First, the directionality problem. We don't know which variable is influencing the other. Are teens anxious because they spend hours on social media? Or do anxious teens turn to social media to cope? A correlational study can't tell us. It's a total chicken or the egg situation. Second, the third variable problem. Maybe something else entirely is causing both variables. Let's say students who are stressed are more likely to scroll through TikTok and report higher anxiety levels. In that case, stress is the sneaky third variable, pulling the strings behind the scenes, like the villain in a plot twist you don't see coming. So yeah, correlation might show a relationship, but it doesn't tell the full story. All right, so now that we know correlation doesn't imply causation, let's talk about what correlation can tell us, because it's still super useful. Correlations can show us two important things, the direction of the relationship and the strength of the relationship. When it comes to direction, correlation can be either positive or negative. A positive correlation means that both variables move in the same direction. We can use our hands. As one goes up, so does the other. Let's look at a few examples. The more time you spend studying, the higher your test scores tend to be. The more hours you sleep you get, the better your mood tends to be. In contrast, a negative correlation means the variables move in opposite directions. Once again, let's use our hands. As one variable goes up, the other goes down. The more screen time you have, the lower your sleep quality tends to be. The more school absences you have, the lower your GPA tends to be. You'll usually see these relationships in a scatter plot, a graph where each dot represents a person or a data point. A tight upward slope, that's a positive correlation. A downward slope, negative correlation. A cloud of dots that look like a toddler sneezes on the screen, yeah, probably no correlation. Now let's talk about strength, how closely those two variables are related. Psychologists use something called a correlation coefficient to measure this. It's a number between negative 1.0 and positive 1.0. The closer a number is to 1.0, whether it's negative or positive, the stronger the correlation. The closer to zero, the weaker the correlation. So take a moment. What would you say about the strength and direction of the following correlation coefficients? Go ahead, pause the video here and try it out. Seriously, pause the video, I'll, I'll wait. All right, ready? Here's the breakdown. Positive 0.89, strong positive relationship. Negative 0.76, strong negative relationship. Positive 0.05, very weak. Basically strangers in the same room. Remember, if the data points hug a line on a scatter plot, the correlation is strong. All right, while important, a correlation study is not the only non-experimental method psychologists use. There are other ways to observe and describe human behavior, even when you can't run an experiment. If a researcher wants to do an in-depth investigation of one person, group, or situation, they might conduct a case study. 
It's like zooming all the way in with a magnifying glass and saying, let's learn everything we can about this one example. One of the most famous case studies in psychology is about a man known as H.M. After undergoing brain surgery to help treat epilepsy, H.M. can no longer create new memories. Psychologists studied him for decades and learned a ton about how memory functions, especially the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory. Case studies are great for collecting rich, detailed data, things like interviews, observations, and medical records. They're especially useful when studying something rare or unusual. But here's the downside. You can't generalize the findings to the larger population. What's true for HM might not be true for the rest of us. Now, psychologists can also observe people or animals in their natural environment without interference. This is called a naturalistic observation study. Researchers might sit near a playground, with permission of course, and watch how kids interact. It's a war zone. Real behavior, real setting. Naturalistic observation is great for studying things that people can't easily fake or that would be hard to replicate or recreate in a lab. But here's the catch. You can't really tell why people are acting the way they are, so its scope is limited. Finally, we have the world's greatest collaboration tool, a meta-analysis. Instead of running one brand new study, a meta-analysis takes a bunch of existing studies on the same topic and combines their results. Let's say there are 30 studies on how sleep affects school performance. Instead of reading them all and guessing, a meta-analysis analyzes the combined data to spot patterns and draw bigger conclusions. Simply put, more data equals more reliable conclusions. All right, let's lock in with a quick recap. We just explored the world of non-experimental methods. How psychologists study behavior when running an experiment is impossible or legal or ethical. Tattoo this on your psych brain. Correlational studies show the relationship between two variables, but remember, correlation does not imply causation. The strength and direction of correlation is shown by number between negative 1.0 and positive 1.0, and scatter plots don't lie. Case studies give us deep insight into individuals or rare situations, but they can't be generalized to everyone. Naturalistic observation helps us see real behavior in real settings, as long as people don't start acting weird because they know they're being watched. And meta-analysis? That's our research super tool, combining the results of multiple studies to spot patterns and get stronger, more reliable conclusions. All right, thanks for watching AP Psych Brainiacs. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss the next video. And as always, when in doubt, trust the data, not your gut. See you next time.